Uh, my name is Lynn Whitelaw. I'm curator of the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art, and I would like to welcome all of you here. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Victoria Cook, the director of the museum, and I'd also like to acknowledge Patty Buster, our education coordinator, uh, who has helped to put this program on. Um, if you've, hopefully you've all had an opportunity to see the exhibition, uh, Frank Rampola, Remembering Frank Rampola. Uh, this exhibition has been one that we are very excited about having here at the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. Um, it actually, the, the kernel for this exhibit began with Eric Lang Peterson, who I'll introduce in just a minute, who gave the inspiration of us doing this exhibit actually 10 years ago. And so here we are today uh, with this exhibition opening up. I'd also like to thank the Rampola family for their assistance in making this exhibition possible, and to the other lenders, the University of Tampa, uh, who had organized a uh, Frank Rampola exhibit back in the 1980s, the Polk Museum of Art, and the Ringling Museum of Art. Uh, also in our museum store, now for the shameless plugs, uh, we have a wonderful book, Frank Rampola, drawings from the personal sketchbooks uh, that is available, uh, that gives you insight, as does the gallery guide, into the number of people who remember Frank Rampola, uh, even though it has been 40 years since his death. Uh, if you would like other further information, you may check the website of www.frankrampola.com uh, for other information. But let me introduce our panel. To my far right is Ron Rampola. Ron is the only child of uh, Frank and Doris Rampola. Uh, Ron was 10 and a half? 11 and a half. 11 and a half uh, when his father passed away. And uh, with his family, they have lovingly and tirelessly uh, worked to honor that work in the memory of Frank Rampola. Fiore Custodi is a colleague of Frank Rampola. They met in 1960 at the Ringling Museum of Art, uh, Ringling School of Art. Robert J. Sandelier, who sits here in the middle to my left, <clears throat> uh, is an art dealer, a gallery owner, and curator. In 1961, uh, Robert opened his first art gallery. He describes his professional relationship with uh, Frank Rampola as a close and warm friendship. Eric Lang Peterson, to my immediate right here, is an art collector. He is also a lender to this exhibit and is known in this area as an art appraiser. Eric purchased his first Rampola painting in the 1960s. Bruce Marsh, on my far left here, is a colleague of Frank Rampola at the University of South Florida. Bruce is Professor Emeritus from Florida, uh, U, uh, University of South Florida, taught there for 34 years, from 1969 to 2003. To my immediate left here is Tom Kettner. He was a student at the University of South Florida. He also was a printmaker and working at Graphic Studio. As, um, as a student, uh, he knew Frank Rampola, but as a printmaker at Graphic Studio, he worked on the last uh, works that Frank Rampola produced, uh, the Requiem series. Uh, in a factual overview of Frank Rampola's life, he was born in New York City of Italian immigrants uh, June 5th, 1941. He died 40 years later in Tampa, Florida on June 25th, 1971. In his short lifespan of 40 years, uh, having had um, rheumatic fever as a child was to compromise his heart and shorten his lifespan. He grew up in a time that had known the Depression and the years of World War II were realities that he experienced. Uh, most would say that Frank Rampola the man was different than Frank Rampola the artist. So we begin with uh, asking our panel here to tell us what was Frank Rampola the man like? Uh, we were fortunate to have Frank Rampola arrive on campus. We didn't know who he was, but the fact that he came from New York City and I was from Brooklyn, we hit it off right away. Uh, soon I began to see a man, a powerhouse, 
Yet he was a very humble person. He just had all kinds of, from Boston University, summa cum laude graduate, and all kinds of information. And I would ask him a question. In a sense, although I was his colleague, I became a student because um, I saw here a person I could tap and learn a hell of a lot. Yeah, I would just like to uh, comment on, the, on what I saw as the huge difference between his work and, and his presence and personality as, as a person, that Frank was quiet and uh, humble and thoughtful and uh, very collegial in terms of, of, of friendship that he shared with everyone. And uh, it seemed at such, at such at odds to some degree with the uh, incredibly uh, gestural and, and to some degree violent work that he produced. And it was really interesting. It was a sort of, of uh, such an opposition, it seemed, from his presence as a person and uh, that gentleness and humility as opposed to that uh, incredible sort of flood of feeling that, that I think we find looking at all the work. Frank, um, Frank was one year and five days older than I. Um, we should have had a lot in common. Physically, you couldn't find two people more different than we, probably. Uh, and it's actually impossible for me to separate Frank, the man, from Frank's work because <laughs> I'm not used to Frank's being gone yet. Um, Craig Rubidoux, who should be here today but isn't um, because he's in Nova Scotia, introduced me to Frank. He also is the one who called me and told me that Frank was gone. <clears throat> And I, I went to the funeral, <clears throat> and I got on a plane the next day and went to Europe, so I didn't have time to grieve. So it's only a very few years that I have stopped thinking, God, I haven't spoken to Frank lately. I need to give him a call. And I can speak from a child's perspective. Um, you know, my father, I was watching Gilligan's Island, you know, in 1968. So I had a very different perspective. But, you know, on Sunday afternoons, he would, he would throw the ball with me. And we collected stamps together. We uh, eventually actually had done it right before his death. We had made a chess set together, uh, a, a bronze chess set. And he taught me how to do lost wax. And I sculpt today as a result of his influence. Um, but we made the king stand. It's about five pounds. It's about 12 inches high. It was written up in the papers back in the early 70s. And it's a really a wonderful piece. And uh, I did the pawns. And it, it was fun. And, and he, he, uh, so it was a, a very bonding experience. And, you know, and I just want to say one thing about my mother. I know this is about my father. But um, my uh, mother was offered, at the time, it was a lot of money. It was $5,000 to make a copy of that chess set. And we could have really used the money at the time after my father passed. And she said, no, I, we're not going to do that because this was for, for Ronnie. I go by Ron now. But uh, my father wanted that to be for me, and, and I still have that today, and, and it's the only one. So that's something I just want to say about my mother was behind my father uh, in his life. And also after he died, she stayed very loyal to him and his work. Our second question is to talk about Frank Rampola, the artist. Um, as a child, he loved to draw. Uh, at the age of 18, he began to take classes at the Art Student League in New York City. He was admitted to the Cooper Union in 1950 um, and uh, completed his training in 1954. He had a great deal of training not only as a painter, but also as a printmaker. But I believe in all the literature, it seems to express that his first love was drawing and everything that he did, in essence, was based on his drawing. Um, his style, his content, his message as an artist was inspiring against the drop backdrop of the 1960s. Um, who would like to address uh, Frank Rampola as an artist? Okay. Several things. Um, what an amazing show. I've never walked into a gallery and seen 
the homogenous palette of an artist that draws everyone together, every piece. It wraps around the room, the, the visceral, uh, uh, the palette for one thing, but beyond that, the energy just flows right from one to the other. The primary purpose of art is to disturb. That, to me, is it. That is to evoke emotion and to provoke discussion. And he did that well. The thing that, that has been a guide for me in collecting is what Frank Rampola said so eloquently. Of, and it's quoted, I think, on one of the uh, boards in the, in the exhibition. Uh, my work, he said, to give dignity without pomp, to lend significance without anecdote, in short, to become a performance of the visual, is my reason for making pictures. Look around at, at, in museums when you're there and at your own collections and, and see which ones stand out as, as fitting that um, treatise that Frank Rampola gave us. Uh, there's, there's a couple observations about Frank's work that are really important to me. And, and uh, one is that uh, for all the visceral, expressionist uh, presentation of, of, of suffering and of pain and, and of emotion that you see in the work, he so carefully plays it against a very formal, rational structure. And if you look at those paintings and look for the symmetry in the paintings, okay, the reference to geometry that exists with the framing of one element and the framing of another element, uh, there's a piece with stenciled numbers that appear behind and, and intermixed with the figures. And this idea of there being this intellectual kind of thread that moves against that very expressive thread of the visceral and, and the pain and the flesh. Uh, I think it's a very interesting thing. Another thing, and this is about the, I think his, his, his just innate gift with the image is to see the work in the prints and to see the work in the painting and then to see the work in those small bronze pieces. And I think it's simply extraordinary to see someone with facility to move from one of those mediums to the other with such unbelievable control and such unbelievable poetry, for want of a better word. I think those little bronzes are simply spectacular. It's seldom I see work I really lust after, and uh, those are among them, <laughs> I mean, those little pieces. I um, only had a, we, we arrived a little late today, so I only had a, a minute or two to look in the museum at the exhibition. And I must say it was like a time warp, um, because at one time or another, I had had virtually all of those paintings in Sindler Gallery in Coral Gables' token slum. Um, I had just been able in the mid-60s, early 60s, to rent the worst building in the best part of town. <laughs> and I converted it into a long, long, clean white space, uh, the like of which wasn't even in Manhattan at that time. And Frank's work was ideal for it. Um, but you can imagine Coral Gables is uh, just slightly to the right politically of Texas. <laughs> and you can imagine the reaction to those paintings yes. nearly 50 years ago. Not 40, but nearly 50 years ago. How many did you sell? I sold some, which was an incredible surprise. Uh, I, had, I, I didn't care. Uh, the reason for hanging the shows, the reason for having a gallery was to be able to hang what you wanted to see. <laughs> Always. Well, as a, as a student, I don't know if I should comment on Frank's work at all. <laughs> but now's, your time. now's, now's <laughs> my time. Well, that's your turn. The most touching thing to me was his generosity as an artist to suffer inside and to put that forward so that all of us could be aware of that. Uh, my little story is I was a student 
And Frank asked me to print his last series of etchings, which I did not know was going to be his last series of etchings, the Requiem Mass. So the night that Frank passed, I had stayed up all night printing Frank's Sanctus. Sanctus, 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 which is holy, holy, holy. So as those prints were being pulled off the press, this wonderful human being was leaving us. But with those prints, he has not left us. I think lastly, we'll talk about Frank Rampola as the educator. And there probably is no greater legacy that can be left than that as a teacher. Um, artist Lynn Davidson probably sums it up the best. Frank Rampola is in every draw, in every line I draw. Uh, would someone like to respond to Frank Rampola as an educator? Um, uh, he left a legacy. You know, when you're powerful, when you disturb people at first and then in a way that they learn, he became a very a legendary teacher. And uh, there were a number of, oh, a dozen students who tried to emulate him, copying him, but it was all superficial. He knew it. But uh, when he got ready to leave, he was so prolific. He had this garage uh, where he had a piano he played, and it was rat infested. It was termite infested. It was a garage at the Ringling School. They didn't care. He, he had wall-to-wall -wall work. And when he got ready to come to Tampa to, to move to USF, he hired a big van. And he asked a number of students to help him load up the work. After they filled the van, there was still tons of work left behind. And he says, that's it. And they looked at him. He says, tell the students to come and get anything they want that I'll leave behind. Well, having um, been involved with art probably longer than anybody else, uh, just because of my longevity, <laughs> um, I have looked at as many Florida artists um, as there are in existence and no individual educator's um, stamp has shown up in as many artists' work as Frank Rampola's. No, he, he, was, he was tough. I mean, uh, you know, I saw many tears in his classroom. Uh, as far as teacher, I think he showed mostly by example. Uh, we always had access to what he was doing personally at the time. And to see an artist live his life in front of our eyes, I think was, a, was the greatest influence as a teacher. It, it wasn't uh, book learning, etc. It was on-the-job training. I knew he had a following in Sarasota, and the students loved him. You, could, you couldn't help but uh, to feel that way. Here, here you had a genuine person who, as, as uh, Tom said, uh, he, he taught by example, and that's the best teaching, consummate worker. Uh, but uh, when he died, uh, <clears throat> we decided to come. It, of course, we had to come to the, uh, there, were, there was a requiem mass at, a, at the church in Tampa. And soon I found, as we were on the road, at that time, I think it was just US 41. I don't think 75 was built yet. And I looked in my rearview mirror as we approached the church, and I saw cars, cars, a long, long line of cars, and they weren't going around us. They were staying behind us. And we approached the church, and I started to turn, and I looked, and, and then from the other direction, from USF, I didn't know it, here comes a line of cars. Students, we didn't know each other. Yet the impression he made in Sarasota was the same impression he made, a great man made, great painter, great artist made in Tampa. And I said to my wife, Pat, look, they're coming from everywhere. And I was so proud of Frank. In doing an oral history on my father and my mother, um, we got responses from all across the country, and from even in, in Brazil, uh, we've had former students that are, have contacted us. Uh, Jerry Allen was one of them. He's, he sent his own video from Mississippi. 
and a slideshow of things he has. And he he's just he's in the, in our book too, quoted in there. He's he's just very supportive. And um, he had t said his brother talked him into coming to Ringling, like like Fury said. But he he ended up jesting for my father, doing a lot of like he's putting the 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 white on before the work was done. It was common to hire a student to do that. Well, he had always heard because of the hype about my father at this time, this, you know, this following in Sarasota, that my father might be famous someday. So Jerry t tell, told me this on the video he sent me, that he would put his name, Jerry Allen, on the, on the gesso, in, uh -huh. and then, of course, paint over it again. My father never knew this. At the event that maybe it would be x-rayed someday, and his name would show up as part of that. I think we'd like to conclude our discussion today by talking about uh, the legacy of Frank Rampola, uh, which we've already sort of started, but would anyone else like to uh, continue? If you look at these paintings, you'll see uh, human beings as survivors and human beings as really strong and able to, to, to triumph over the things they're subject to. <clears throat> subjected to. I, th I think that these are really vital. Almost every figure is almost athletic. I mean, they're so robust and alive. They seem to me that there's an inherent sort of dignity to them and strength to them, you know, that belies what they're passing through, that belies the suffering that, that uh, they're experiencing. When you look at Goya uh, portraying the invasion of the French on those Spanish people, not very uplifting. You look at Kathy Collowitz's work, not very uplifting. Frank lived with these people. He was aware of his own mortality. I think, psycholo I'm not a psychologist, but somebody mentioned how did he feel, think psychologically. I thought he believed that man, humankind had the opportunity to do great things, but because of his, the sinful ways that he, mankind, humankind is, they would never happen. And they repeated the atrocities, and today in Syria you got him again. And that's why his work will hold up, because he's trying to say to us, when will it stop? And he did go to where he had to go to make the statements he had to make. And, and I think if we think about that, we find a, a, a universe, while his life is very short, I think his, as there's a saying in, in art, that life is short, but art is long. And I think those, those important, maybe not so uplifting things will be remembered. Maybe, who knows, I don't think humankind's gonna change, but at least he's saying, hey, you know, you're not fooling me, I know what you're about. That uh, any comparison to anyone else, to me, is just shallow. <clears throat> he was his work is um, it, it's reminiscent but never derivative and that saves it he's not derivative at anything but yes maybe reminiscent but they're we're all in the same planet together at a certain time and it, it would be reminiscent of anyway I was very glad to hear you quote the Goethe Life is fleeting, but art is long, because that is so true. Uh, there's a very good reason for painting the nude body, because you don't have clothing which limits your thinking to a, a particular period of time to which you can match the costume. Um, it's, so the ideas are good for any time, um, and that is really what any artist of any substance wants to do. They're, they're not interested in impressing a current audience. And if the work is so specific, I mean, there are other people who have dealt with man's inhumanity to man, but frequently it's not done in such a way that it's going to be significant after another generation passes. But, um, and I, I was interested to read a quotation of mine in the book, and I have no recollection of writing that. It, uh, I didn't make it up. <laughs> uh, you're sure, you're sure. And, and, it, and I, some, I say something like, at a time when we are hard up for heroes, and certainly this is a time when we are. And the, the way that Frank expressed this, um, is good for all time, I think. <clears throat>
Lawrence. 